Well, if you want to turn in your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to finish up uh, that last name uh, of Jesus that we've been talking about. You know, we, we started, I guess it's been four, four and a half weeks ago now, um, where we, right after Thanksgiving, we started going through this process of Isaiah 9, 6, where Isaiah gives us four names. Really, um, in Isaiah 7, it talked about some other names, and I, but in Isaiah uh, 9 verse 6, it gives us four distinct names. We, we all know from Matthew and Luke's Gospels and from Isaiah chapter 7 that he, they said that, that this baby would be born and he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's what we looked at that very first week uh, as far as what it means. But then these last four weeks, we've looked at what it means, God with us. What does it mean that who is this God who is with us? Is he just some arbitrary figure? Is he something very specific? And what we found is, is through these names that Isaiah has given us, it has actually helped us to understand the personality of God, understand why he came, to, to show us exactly who he is, the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And today we look at that last name, the last name uh, in Isaiah 9, 6, we'll read that together again this morning as we get started, because <clears throat> I want to just reiterate where we've been going. But Isaiah 9, 6 says, for a child will be born to us, the prophecy of, of Jesus' is coming, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Now, I want to tell you today, I don't believe there's any name of God that is more misunderstood than this last name. There's probably no other name that is more the reason people don't follow God than a misunderstanding of this last name. The Prince of Peace. As a matter of fact, um, most of you, you know, I told you I'd been, I had been uh, reading and watching, reading a, 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 a kind of a booklet about Christmas and watching a video that um, um, J.D. Greer had put out uh, about kind of these names and, and this kind of idea. And most of you know, he, he pastors a church in Raleigh, kind of in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. But there's also a, a gentleman who lives in that same area by the name of Bart Ehrman or Ehrman. I'm not sure if he pronounces it Ehrman or Ehrman. But Bart Ehrman is a professor of New Testament at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Bart Ehrman is also a person who has spent most of his life and, and has made most of his fortune being a best-selling author questioning what the Gospels tell us about Jesus. Now, did you hear me? He's a New Testament professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, but he's made his fortune in life writing books questioning the veracity and the truth of what the Gospels tell us about Jesus. He lives in that Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina area, and um, J.D. Greer was saying he would had many chances to go to different events because they live in the same area that this professor had put on. And he said at one particular time he was at an event in Bart Ehrman was asked this question, what would it take to get you to believe in Jesus? Remember, professor of New Testament. What would it take to get you to believe in Jesus? And here was his answer, very simply, but also I think uh, it tells a lot about even where our society is today. His answer was simply this. If, if Jesus had fulfilled his promise to bring peace on earth. What would it take to get you to believe in Jesus? His answer, if Jesus had fulfilled his promise to bring peace on earth. And I want to tell you, I believe in my ministry of almost 21 years now. Maybe it wouldn't be worded exactly that way, but I believe this is probably one of the biggest problems that many people have with Jesus. They say he was supposed to be the prince of peace, but he didn't seem to deliver. He didn't seem to bring that peace that he promised. 
So when he was born, you know, that angelic choir in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, pronounced that he had brought peace on earth. You know, we sing the songs, Silent Night. You know, we sing all the songs about peace and all that kind of stuff. And, but, but here we are. We just talked about 2020. What are some of the things that have happened in 2020 besides a pandemic? Rioting. Problems with systemic racism in our society. That leading to more rioting and looting and killing and battles against police and civilians. And we've seen all of this, haven't we? Let me just ask you, have any of you just sat back in your easy chair one day and said, well, I'm just so thankful for all the peace we have on earth today? Of course not. We probably question too, don't we? What is the deal? What is the deal with this prince of peace? And so many people, we, our world is still so impacted by violence and, and so many poverty uh, still afflicts so many people. We experience daily uh, the these impacts on our society. So why didn't Jesus fulfill the promise of the title Isaiah gave him, the Prince of Peace? Was bringing peace on earth just really too big a task for God to be able to undertake? What, what's the deal with this? Well, unfortunately, so many times we, when we think of peace in that way, we are looking at something that is way way smaller than what God had in mind. You see, God wasn't thinking, you know, as a matter of fact, I've often wondered some, sometimes, because you remember when Jesus was here on earth, you know, he's named the Prince of Peace, yet Jesus said one time, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. We almost, or if we're not careful, we're, 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 is the Bible in conflict there? Did, did Isaiah just misunderstand what God told him when he prophesied, when, when God spoke to him, or, or what happened there? Well, we have to look at what did God really mean? What was Isaiah's real prophecy when he named him the Prince of Peace? Well, if we look at it, and I can tell you in my own life, I can tell you as a pastor for the last almost 21 years, what I have found out, and I quote this. This is a quote from J.D. Greer. He says, horizontal dysfunction very often goes back to a vertical disconnect from God. In other words, we don't see the peace of God in our lives and in our world, the horizontal aspect of our lives, because we do not enjoy peace with God, the vertical aspect of our lives. You see, when Jesus is named the Prince of Peace, it's not about everything being peaceful on earth. It's not even about everything being peaceful in my life. It's about me being made at peace with God the Father. It is about me being made at peace and having the ability to be made at peace with God the Father. Well, you know, what if all the problems in your life ultimately stem from or were at least uh, made worse or exacerbated by the reality that you are separated from God? You see, that's what we have to help people realize. That's what we have to realize in our lives is that it's not about everything being peaceful, because I'm going to tell you what, there, there hasn't been a peaceful year uh, since God created the earth almost, except for, especially since Adam and Eve fell, right? You see, what, what came and broke the peace, there was peace on earth, wasn't there? When God created the heavens and the earth and he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, and he placed them there with all the animals, and Adam named all the animals, and they're there, and they're working, they're tilling the land, and, and everything's going, there was peace on earth. There was truly peace on earth, but that all changed the day that Adam and Eve chose to go their own way. When they chose to disobey God and do their own thing, peace was eradicated. There was a, there was a break in society. There was a break that wasn't supposed to be there. A break, see, because God is a relational God. God wants to relate. We, we see that going all the way back to creation, don't we? When, when God had the, was having the conversation within himself that said, let us go down and make man in our image. Let us create uh, God, as we know it, the, the Trinity. We talk about the Trinity, and, and, and I don't have time to dive into all that, plus most of our brains would explode if we really tried to dive into really trying to understand it. But we know that God exists as one in three, right? 
He's one God, yet exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which tells us that God is a relational God. He relates, to, he relates within himself, and he wants to relate to us as well. As we think about this whole idea of, uh, of, of peace, the problem is much, much bigger than we realize. The truth is that each of us has pursued a life of conflict with God. You say, well, I haven't. Well, let me just illustrate that a little bit. You know how we have, and, and, and me too, <laughs> we pursue a life in conflict with God. You know how we do that? Listen to this. If this doesn't hit home, you're not listening. The reason we pursue a life that is in conflict with God is because we don't want him to be in charge. We don't want to need him. We don't want him to get the praise. No, we want to be in charge. We want to be independent. We want to decide what's right and wrong, and we want to enjoy all the praise. Does that sound familiar? Oh, yeah, we can all sit here and, you know, and, and put our holy glasses on and pretend that's not us, but let's be honest, that's us, isn't it? That's us in a nutshell. We want control of our lives. We want to say what we're going to do, when we're going to do it where we're going to go, how we're going to do it. We're going to, we, we want the, when we do something good, when we make a, anybody, you know, any of you parents, any of you, you students ever make the dean's list and you just don't tell anybody? That's, yeah, I, I, that's laughable, isn't it? Yeah, of course, of course we want to tell people. We're proud of that accomplishment, don't we? And there's nothing wrong with being proud of that accomplishment. But the problem we have to do is, why do we want all the praise? Why do we want all the glory? Because we think we've done something. And this attitude is what the Bible calls sin. It's the universal human condition of all people. Whether or not somebody considers himself religious or non-religious is really inconsequential. We all deal with sin. You know, <laughs> if you don't believe it's difficult, I want you to, uh, have you ever tried to live the way that God lays out in the Bible for 24 hours? Not just in what you do, but in what you say, in what you think. I can't do it. I, it, I mean, it's, it's difficult. Our struggle, like many other people around the world, is that we want our... our, our bent is to turn away from God, not toward him. You see the irony, when we turn away from God to get more freedom or approval or acceptance, we find the opposite. You see, shutting God out, we feel vulnerable, exposed, ashamed, under judgment, in darkness. That's why our world, that's why our world hates God, because the more they shut him out, the more they feel condemned. That's why, if, don't, don't stop at John 3, 16 when you Read that great verse, read 17 and 18, because Jesus goes on to say that God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But he also expresses in that that the world was already condemned. It already felt that condemnation. And you know, you ever, you ever just been around somebody and you're not doing anything, you're not trying to condemn them, you're, not, you're just living a, trying to live a godly life, you're trying to speak truth into their life, you're trying to be an encouragement, and sometimes people will get mad at you. And they'll, they'll, they'll just, they'll, all of a sudden, they'll, they'll walk away from you because they say, well, I'm tired of your, you, your condemning attitude. Well, what condemning attitude? I'm just trying to tell you the truth of Jesus. I'm just trying to live out my faith. I'm trying to share with you the truth of the gospel. Because God is a relational God, and he is the prince of peace. But so many people run away from God because they don't experience peace in their horizontal life. But it's mainly because they're not experiencing peace in their vertical life. They have no peace with God, and therefore everything in their life is chaotic. And when the life gets more chaotic, what do they do? Whether they believe in him or not, they continue to, to continue to blame God more and blame God more and push more blame on him. Even though we look at our lives, we realize that most of the problems we have in our life are because of horizontal relationships here on earth. Because of how we view those things and how we put so much priority on those things and so little priority on the other. You know, the question might be asking, well, well, Mark, well, 
So, so what does it take? What would it take to return to that peace that we long for? One simple word, forgiveness. Forgiveness. And that is why Jesus came. That is what the title, Prince of Peace, points us to. Into a world of darkness, a world of in rebellion against God. Especially in that day, God sent a child. He would live the most unusual life. He wouldn't live the the life of a king. He would live the life of a pauper. He was born into poverty. He wouldn't rule from a throne. He would make his life with the guilty, the oppressed. He would eventually die an unjust death, a criminal's death. Even though nobody in the world could point to anything he had ever done wrong. He died like a criminal. It sounds like a tragic end, doesn't it? But it's not. It was the God-ordained end. The Old Testament is full of pictures of what God's Son would achieve. And Isaiah provides us with one of those in Isaiah 53, verse 5. Just a few chapters over, uh, this prophet goes from the prophesying that he would be born, the Prince of Peace, to telling us exactly how he would die. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our sin, or for our well-being, or for our peace, fell upon him. And by his wounds, or by his scourging, we are healed. This is the purpose for which Jesus was born. You, you've heard me say throughout this entire Christmas season, you hear me say this throughout every Christmas season, that you can't celebrate Christmas without Easter. You can't truly understand the impact of the birth without the cross. Jesus was born for the purpose of dying to take the punishment necessary to bring us peace with God. Christmas has always and will always lead to Easter. Why? Because forgiveness. Remember Prince of Peace? How do you get back to peace? It only comes through forgiveness. And forgiveness always comes at a cost. Forgiveness always costs somebody something. A lot. I thought this was a great story and I want to share it. J.D. Greer was talking about a Muslim friend he had. He lived in Southeast Asia for a while, and he said that his, a Muslim friend asked, he said he remembered him asking him one time, why would God need somebody to die in order to forgive our sin? You know, that may be a question that even you've asked before. That may be a question that you've pondered in your heart as to why is it necessary for someone to die in order to forgive our sin. Well, listen to this. I I thought this was a great illustration. He said, I I answered him this way. If you sinned against me and I wanted to forgive you, I wouldn't make you kill your dog before before I forgave you. Why would God require some kind of sacrifice to forgive? Here's the answer. That's the way he put it. Now, here's the answer. It says, choosing to forgive somebody means that you are agreeing to absorb the cost of the injustice of what they've done. Now, the illustration is this. Imagine you stole my car. Imagine you stole my car and you went out and you wrecked it. You don't have insurance and or the money to pay for it. So what are my choices for you since you stole my car? Well, I could make you pay for it. I could take you before a judge and request a court-mandated payment plan. You might never pay it off, and you'd always be in my debt. That's one choice I have. You know, I, maybe I drive a real fancy sports car, and it costs a lot of money, and you can't ever pay it off. I don't, but the second choice I have is what? I could forgive you. You know, what am I choosing to do if I say I forgive you? You see, I'm not just sending good feelings your way. I'm not choosing, he said, what I'm doing is I am choosing to absorb the cost of your wrong. If I don't hold you accountable for paying for the damage to my car, I'll have to pay the price of having my car fixed. 
I'll take the hit for the injustice you did to me. You have no debt to pay, not because there was nothing to pay, but because I paid it all for you. Not only that, I'm choosing to absorb the pain of your treatment of me. I have the right to say we cannot be friends now. You won't be coming into my house anymore. But instead, I'm choosing to give you friendship and acceptance even though you deserve the opposite. This is always how forgiveness works. It comes at a cost. If you forgive someone, listen to this, folks, because I'm going to tell you what, we have such a misunderstanding of what real forgiveness is. Because in our minds, I'll forgive you, but I'm going I'm to hold it against you forever. That's not real forgiveness. Did you hear what he said? There is always This is always how forgiveness works. It comes at a cost. If you forgive someone, you bear the cost rather than insisting that the wrongdoer does. And that is what Jesus, the mighty God, was doing when he came to earth and lived as a man and died a criminal's death on a cross. The mighty God on that cross absorbed the pain and the penalty of for mine and your rebellion against his rule and our rejection of his love. God basically said, it will go no farther than here. You deserve punishment, but I will take it. You deserve separation, but I will take it. You do not deserve welcome or acceptance, but I will offer it. That's, what, that, that's why Christmas is so important. Because his coming is the Prince of Peace. Jesus offered forgiveness. He said, I accept you when we are unacceptable. He said, I offer you a different kind of peace. When Jesus said, he said, my peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, but I give you a different kind. What is that? It's not a peace with all my brothers. It's a peace with the Father. Guess, guess what? I can, I can sometimes mimic and get peace with my brothers, can I? By forgiving or, or by accepting or overlooking. I, I, can, I can create some sort of peace with my brothers. I have no ability to create peace with God on my own. None whatsoever. That only comes from a substitute. The fact that Jesus came and offered us acceptance he offered us relationship he offered us forgiveness when we deserve punishment see that's why jesus cried out as he died in matthew 27 46 my god my god why have you forsaken me you see in all of existence there had never been a separation in the godhead God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had been a unified body. But in that moment on the cross, just before Jesus gave it up, when all of the sin of the world, as Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, 5, we mentioned a moment ago, when, when all of the sin of the world was, was just laid on Jesus, for that moment, for that momentary time, for the first time ever, there was a separation in the Godhead. There was a distance between God the Son and God the Father that he had never felt before. And that's why in that moment he cried out to God, and it was for you, it was for me, that he took on that separation so that we could be brought back together with him and know, and now know what it felt like to be joined with him instead of separated from him, because that's the only feeling we had ever known. And he did that for you and I. That's why Christmas is so important. That's why the Prince of Peace is such a powerful name. He did it for us. You see, the reason Jesus cried out is because he was going through hell. And you know what hell is? You know, I've told you what what makes heaven heaven, right? What makes heaven heaven is the fact that Jesus is there. Not streets of gold, not gates of pearl, not all this stuff that we focus on. What makes heaven heaven is the fact that Jesus is present. And what makes hell hell 
is that it is a place of total separation from God's love and acceptance. And it's where we're all headed because we have chosen to walk away from God. And it's what God himself went through in our place. God was separated from God. That punishment that brought peace to us was upon him. That is what it cost Jesus. Remember what I said a moment ago? Forgiveness always comes at a cost. When we forgive someone, usually we absorb a personal cost. That's why the Bible is so adamant that we as believers are always the ones to initiate forgiveness. We're not to hold grudges. We're not to let a root of bitterness well up inside of us and get in our lives. I want to tell you what, there's more people today who are outside of the walls of the church of God, who are outside of the family of God because they have watched believers harbor bitterness and watched believers not forgive and they don't know how to forgive because they haven't seen it. You see, Jesus hung on the cross that Friday afternoon, about 30 years after he had laid in that manger. The debt of sin was paid. You know, one of the, we, we talk about this all the time at Easter, but very rarely at Christmas. One of the last words that Jesus uttered from the cross was a Greek word. Where we, we translated, it is finished. It is finished. But the Greek word, and, and I actually had this, I, I, somebody gave this to me um, when we moved into our new house, I, I think it was. We moved into the house we're in now. And it sits on my desk in my little office at the, at the house, and it says simply, to tell us die. It's the Greek word that is translated, it is finished. But so many times we really don't um, grasp that entire meaning of that word. Let me, let me just get this to you so we can understand what it means to be forgiven. You see, in, in that word, to tell us die, that Jesus cried from the cross, the it is finished, the battle cry, that is the word, to tell us die, that is scribbled on a tax bill when it was paid in that day. It meant the debt is cleared. It's all gone. So Jesus, hanging on the cross, when he uttered these words, was looking at your sin, and what he was saying when he uttered that word from the cross was this, it is paid. The debt is cleared. Now you can be forgiven. This is what makes Christianity so unique. This is what makes Christianity different than any other religion in the world. Jesus' last word said, it's complete. The debt's paid. You can be forgiven. Buddha's final words were strive without ceasing. Jesus said, I have done the striving for you, and it's done. It's finished. So when God promised through Isaiah, that a child would be born who would be called the Prince of Peace. He was not talking about that child's earthly rise to power. He was talking about that child's sacrificial death on our behalf. You see, we think about peace, and we automatically think about world peace. We think about laying the guns down, no more war, everybody holding hands and skipping around the world singing Kumbaya together. That's what we think about with peace. Do, do you know that that is impossible in society? That that is not going to happen this side of heaven, that is not going to happen because Jesus didn't come to bring peace on earth. He came to bring peace in your heart. He came to bring peace between you and him. We're always going to struggle. You know, I, I, I've had the same question so many times when I see terror in our world, when I see conflict in families, you know, when I see missionaries, I, I, I think about Jim Elliott. I, I, this, this goes, I think about Jim Elliott. That's one that just has always kind of boggled my mind. Here's a man and a wife who have given their life to go into the remotest areas of some of the darkest and most dangerous areas in the world to share the gospel. And what happens to Jim Elliott? He dies before he really even gets started. He's captured by one of those 
carnival, you know, one of those uh, tribes, cannibalistic tribes, and we don't know exactly what happened to him, but our, our, our imaginations run wild, don't they? And we think, what kind of God would call a man to go tell people the gospel and then allow him to be killed? Is that God out of touch with reality? Is that God impotent and powerless and couldn't stop that? I thought he came to bring peace, the prince of peace. And I don't understand, and I'll never understand those things. But I have to, under, I have to know this. We live in a world that is dominated and controlled by sin. And because of that, bombings happen in Nashville. Because of that, churches burn with fire, probably because of an electrical glitch in the HVAC system, potentially. Missionaries are murdered. Christians are suffering. And I don't get it. And, I, you know, and, and, and just like Bart Ehrman, who, who makes the comment, if Jesus would have just filled that prophecy of peace with God, of, of being the Prince of Peace, I could believe in Jesus. But Jesus didn't come to bring peace necessarily between you and I because there's always going to be people who live a life of sinfulness. There's always going to be people who choose their own way. Let's be honest. That's the way we desire to go most of the time. But Jesus came to bring peace between me and between you and the Father. Because there was, here, here's the thing, every one of us when we're born, we're born under the wrath of God. We're born separated from God by our sin, by the fact that we're born into sin, by the fact that we choose to sin. Even at the earliest age as children, we begin to tell lies. We begin to desire our own way. We want to make our own path. We want to do our own thing. We want to tell God how we're going to do it and expect him just to say, bless you. Go ahead, my brother. When God says, no, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end of it is death. And I know it doesn't always make sense, but that's when it has to come down to the fact, do we trust the word of God, which has been the same for all of our existence, or do we trust our feelings? Do we trust how we feel today, or do we trust what the Word of God says? Because you see, when we're at peace with God, everything changes. It's not about my circumstances. It's about the fact that I know that I'm accepted in the eyes of the only person whose opinion ultimately really matters. It's the fact that we know that whatever we pass through in life and however we come to death, a welcome awaits us in eternity. You see, so many times we want to believe that that Isaiah 53, 5 passage means that all my earthly ailments are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. By his, um, as it says there in verse 5, by his scourging, we are healed. We want to believe that has to do with our physical being on this earth. You know what? God never promised us health in this earth. God never totally promised us that we'd be wealthy on this earth. Listen, we get sick. Why? Because we live in a world that's dominated by sin. And when sin entered the world, everything changed. Does God desire us to be well? I believe he does. Does God want us to have plenty? I believe he does. David talks about it over and over again in the scriptures. But I'm going to tell you what, there's no guarantee of that. Why? Because the only thing we are promised in those wounds, how we are healed, is we are healed in our relationship with God. We are, we are brought back into right relationship with him so that we can spend eternity with him. And whether you live to be 95 or 105 or 35, James says this life is a vapor. But eternity, well, we can't even wrap our minds around that. We can't even comprehend that because it never ends. And what we realize is as children of God, no matter, listen, I, I, in America is the only place in the world, I believe, that Christians 
have a problem with what I'm about to say. You go to China, you go to India, you go to many of the Muslim countries around our world, especially the more strict Muslim countries around our world, Christians have no problem with earthly suffering, with with losing everything. Mainly in America do we have a problem with that because America, I believe, is the only place where the church believes that we have some right to health and wealth to peace and prosperity and to coast through life and get raptured out before the, God, before the tribulation because God surely doesn't want us to suffer. I'm not sure which Bible you've been reading, but there's a whole lot in the Bible about the apostles and how they suffered. Not because they did anything wrong, not because God went to sleep, not because God was a, but in the midst of all those things, I see them rejoicing. You see, the peace with God is so much more important than the, than the peace with man. Jesus never had peace among the religious people. He was always attacked. He was always bombarded, but he still had peace. Why? Because he spent time with the Father. He was in relation with the Father. The only time that he felt the agony that many times you and I feel was that brief moment when sin was on him, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you feel like God's forsaken you today? I know I've been there. Boy, there's been times when I've been there, and I just questioned, and I didn't know what to believe. But I want to tell you what, it's in those moments that I have to go back to the Word, and I have to believe the Word of God where Jesus says, I am with you everywhere you go, where God says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. But his ultimate goal is not to make me happy. His ultimate goal is to bring me to himself holy and righteous and just. And that only happens through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we know that we need not fear eternal darkness anymore when we come to peace with God. We know we are a somebody because we know that Jesus loves us enough to die for us. You know, sometimes we've seen this in people. When they started following Jesus, they are somebody, they find peace with God. They start displaying that peace of God. Their vertical transforms the horizontal. You see, we, we want the horizontal to transform the vertical, and it's backwards. The vertical is what transforms the horizontal. You want to be at peace with others? you got to first be at peace with God. These people become more loving husbands. They become more content wives. They be- become gentler parents. They become more forgiving. That's because their souls were made right, were made for God, And as Augustine, that 4th century African bishop said, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. One day, the peace we all yearn for will finally come. Peace on earth will come, and it will be final. That baby who grew and died on the cross also rose from a grave. And one day, according to Scripture, he will come again into this world, not in, a, in weakness as a baby, but in power as a king. On that day, this child will restore the earth to the way it was intended to be. He will right all the wrongs. He will end all diseases. He will restore justice. In that day, peace on earth will be a reality. But before he came to institute the peace of God on earth, he came to die for our sin and to bring us peace with God. You know, what if we thought about the fact that all of our problems in life ultimately stemmed from or at least were exacerbated by the reality that we are separated from God? What if the Prince of Peace died to offer you an acceptance from God? And a peace with God that will change your life both now and forever. The question is, what do you call God? For the last several weeks, we've talked about different names for God. 
But what do you call God? You know, growing up, my father, my father's real name is Doc Preston Bishop. Now, everybody that knows him calls him Billy because the reason for that is, is my grandmother wanted to name him after my grandfather. He was the first child, firstborn son. And she wanted to name him after my grandfather. But when he was born, my grandfather was actually off at, in Germany or somewhere with, with World War II. He was, he was away from home. And he didn't want my father to be named after him in case something happened to him in the war. And he didn't want to have to carry that burden of carrying that name in something if, and his father had died in, in war. So as most good ladies do, she, godly ladies, she chose to name him not William Anderson Bishop after my grandfather, but she named him Doc Preston Bishop. And then she called him Billy his whole life. So grandma wins both ways, right? I share that to say this. I can remember growing up, my dad had a lot of names. If somebody ever called the house and asked for Doc, it was one of two people. It was a telemarketer or it was work. Because that was the only people that knew him by that name. Kind of impersonal, didn't really know him. Now, if you heard someone call him Bill or Billy, then they were probably a friend or an acquaintance. Someone who knew him well. I was one of three that have the privilege of calling him daddy or dad. That's another level of intimacy because I really knew him. He, he knew me and I knew him. What do you call God? Is he your eternal father? Or is he your wonderful counselor who... You allow to guide you in your life. Who you allow to speak into your life and give you direction. Is he your mighty God who you place your faith and trust in, knowing that he can protect and watch over you and bring you to that end that he desires? Is he your eternal father who speaks into your life? Is he your prince of peace who's brought you peace with God the Father? You see, we have to realize today who God is. We need to realize today what God has done in our life. We need to realize today that God desires a relationship with us. And he wants to be all those things to us. The question is, will we allow him? Will we know him? Will we let him speak into our hearts and our lives in a way that brings peace? Maybe not with everybody around us. Maybe not in every situation in our life. Because you remember, we live in a world that really set out to destroy him and wants to do the same to you and I. You see, Satan realizes something in the Christian's life. Satan realizes he can't have us. Ultimately, by his wounds, we are ultimately healed. We are healed for all of eternity. That begins even now when we know him as our Lord and Savior. We have a peace with God that we can't get on our own. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everything in your life is going to go perfect. Because there is a war going on around us that wants to strip you of your joy, that wants to rob you of relationships, that wants to rob you of everything in your life, especially wants to rob you of that relationship of peace between you and God. And while ultimately, if we've accepted Christ, we, that ultimately can't be broken. The joy and the peace of that relationship can be when we allow the things of this world to get in the way and disrupt our vertical relationship with God. So the question today is simple. Number one, have you ever come to peace with God? Ultimate peace, salvation, 
in calling on Jesus and saying, I accept that life that came to a manger, that lived it out perfectly, that ministered it powerfully, and then died perfectly. That arose out of the grave and will one day come again. I receive that. I, 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 I'm receiving your substitution. I'm receiving what I des- I, I'm, I'm taking what I don't deserve because you took what I did deserve. I deserve punishment. I deserved death. I deserved hell. But I received Jesus. And with receiving Jesus, I get the inheritance that he brings. I'm not sitting up here today telling you if you'll do that, that your life will be perfect and that all your troubles will be over. But I can tell you this. In the midst of those, you can have a different kind of peace. A peace that understands and knows that while this world is trying to destroy me, my God is building me up. For his good and my glory and his glory and my good. Do you trust him today? Maybe you're a believer who's this 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 2020 has taken a lot of people's peace, let's be honest. But it's time to refocus. The new year is always a good time to just renew and refocus and realize that God came to bring peace between me and between me and God. Didn't always guarantee peace here. But this is the most important peace. Do you have it and are you experiencing it today?